Welcome to Calculus Chat, a weekly discussion with your lecturers for 114. I'm Dr. Biggs, and here with me is the rest of the 114 lecturing team, Dr. Kellerman. Hello. And Professor Van der Valt. Hello. Wow, that was uh, uh, quite an intense uh, first week. So much happening, uh, so many new things, and so much beautiful engagement. The Discord has been so busy. The signal has been blowing up. I am so pleased. Yeah, I must say I'm very so impressed with our... Uh... <laughs> yes, I, I, well, I'm, for one, very impressed with how active our students are. I mean, my tutorial was buzzing. I carried on 25 minutes over the time. And we still didn't answer all the questions. That was great. And I mean, the response in the chat, you know, people participating, I, I really enjoyed that. Yes, and I was very impressed to see on Discord the students helping out each other and uh, great mathematical curiosity coming through from the students. That was a very good thing to see. I've, ne I've never actually seen anything like this in any of the courses that I've taught before. So this is a very good start. Yeah, I, I, I hope we can, together with our students, keep up this, this energy. I think it's uh, quite special and we can, can learn a lot uh, by engaging uh, so actively together uh, in this module. Uh, so we also had the, the worksheet one, which is, of course, what we discussed mainly in the tutorials. I think we, we might have gotten a little carried away with the sets. <laughs> we won't be needing quite that much detail of sets uh, in our course, but well... No, I, I, I think it's good. I mean, sets are the, the building blocks of mathematics, literally. I mean, uh, the axioms of mathematics are written in terms, in, in terms of sets. And, you know, we may not be explicitly working that much with sets, but understanding how they work, intersections, unions, all those things, inclusion. I mean, this is fundamental, actually, to getting a really good, deep understanding of, this, of a lot of the things that we're going to do. Yeah, no, I think it's good that we've we've spent some time getting those fundamentals in. Yeah, I don't think it's been a waste of time. It's 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 given us a, a more of a solid foundation going forward, right? And a more of a, a, a logical and critical way to think also about our mathematical statements and mm. and what does it mean for a statement to be true and what does it mean to find a counterexample to show that a statement is false. These are are fundamentally important not just in order to understand what's going on, right? But in order to um. I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a busy week for you as well, not just for the students. <laughs> it's been a busy week for me as well. <laughs> the set theory is also not that hard if you simply use the definitions. Um, mm. Yes, and I, I think this is also a good lesson for our students going forward. When you're answering a question, most of the time... If you just write down what is the definition of the things that are involved and what is, it, what is it that you're trying to show and define what that is, then almost you've already answered the question. Yeah. I, well, I was quite, it was quite surprising to me that, that the tutorial this week, it kind of at some point became a mini tutorial in mathematical logic. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Students who are also doing WTW 115 will uh, do similar set theory at a later stage. This is a good preparation for what they'll be doing later on in WTW 115. Yes, and in 115, I understand you also are digging into a little bit more first order uh, logic formally with quantifiers uh, and prepositions and, and, and treating that, that, that kind of statements in a bit of a more formal and organized way. Yes. That's correct. Cool. So uh, we've made a, a very solid start, I think, right? We've got some basic notation, some few words that we now have in agreement so that we can speak to one another mathematically. We've, we've quickly revisited uh, inequalities and a little bit of trig, right? And please uh, get used to radians. This is uh, really the, the language we need to be speaking in this course, right? And uh, we've also uh, gone and uh, revisited inequalities, uh, I think, uh, uh, some of our students might be a little bit rusty and need to revisit some of those rules, but that's why we have lots of good exercises. And in fact, uh, all of this fun will continue in Worksheet 2, which is still going to be based on all the lectures in the first week. Yes, and know your trick special angles. You should be able to work out any of those uh, trick special angles without a calculator. Draw that triangle you know, to help you with the special angles. Yeah, and um, um, 
appreciate and understand the definitions of these things. Uh, an interesting point came on on Discord, which I quite liked, was the, that they were confused as to why COT on their calculator wasn't evaluating the same as 1 over 10, right? Because 10 can go to infinity. So 10 of pi over 2, for instance, is not defined, but COT of pi over 2 is defined, mm. right? So COT is not the same as 1 over 10 everywhere. Mm. It's it's just well, most places. And yeah. so, and so we, we, we do always need to go back to how is it that we define yeah. the objects we're talking about mm. and, and make sure we understand that. Yes, that's an important point. Because a function, um, it's not just the formula that describes how the function operates on numbers. The part of the definition of a function is its domain. And this is precisely why cot and 1 over 10 are not the same function. They have different domains. Yes, and it also shows not to rely too heavily on your calculator once again. Would it be accurate to say anything in WTW114 that can be done with a calculator can also be done without a calculator? Well, I think the, the way we design questions in 114 is you should be doing be able to do everything without a calculator. In fact, that is the advised way of doing things, is to make sure um, uh, you, you are using your, your reasoning in mm. order to do that, to not use a crutch of a calculator. We're not going to ask you impossible things that you cannot calculate by hand for which you need a calculator. Everything we do, you don't need a calculator for. And very often, we're going to be throwing in symbols and some variables and an A and a B, and then your calculator is going to be useless. So it's, it's very important that you keep on practicing uh, your manipulation and, and you don't have the, the crutch of just relying on your calculator to do that for you. Yes. I mean, uh, I think I, me personally, I'm, I'm much more interested in the things that the calculator can't do than in the things that it can do. And I think in, in these days of uh, computers... I mean, computers can do so many things that they couldn't do even 10 years ago. So uh, uh, I think the important things for a human being to, to, be a, to be good at are the things that computers cannot do. And computers are much better than us at calculating. Uh, I presume an answer like, say, 10-5, and uh, students can just leave it as 10-5. 10-5 is actually a better answer than if you give a decimal approximation, because if you give a decimal approximation, you're losing infinitely many decimals, you're losing an infinite amount of information, whereas if you leave your answer symbolically as 10.5, that is a mathematically exact answer. And in a course like WTW115, it's not only an acceptable answer, it's actually a better answer. Absolutely. If, if you give us a decimal approximation for an answer, you will get marked down most likely. We don't want that. We want the exact value, right? If you have something involving pi, your answer has pi as a constant there. It doesn't have 3.14 whatever approximating pi. No. In fact, there was an interesting case I read about in the first Gulf War in the early 90s, um, an American Patriot missile that missed its intended target by about a half a kilometer and ended up hitting an American base instead of the intended target because of a of a rounding error. Calculators also make rounding errors that um, can actually your, your your decimal approximation could even be wrong. Yeah, and I, that is a fascinating topic, and and uh, some of our students might see a little bit about this if they do some numerical analysis later. Is 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 all the kind of weird things that can start happening when you you on edge cases, when you're dividing by something close to a zero, when you're do, doing some kind of manipulations, even though that expression you have is the exact answer, if you try and compute it, you can get something that is incredibly wrong. And so when you, you do numerical analysis, part of the, the problem is how do you design a robust algorithm? Mm. How do you tell the computer to solve it in a way that will be accurate? Yeah. Because just punching it in can lead to catastrophic results. Yes. I know uh, one of the first things that uh, students are given to do in uh, the third year numerical analysis uh, course is to, is to solve a system of linear equations numerically just using Gauss elimination. And then you end, and the example is designed in such a way that your pivots, your entries on the diagonal are small, and then this results in enormous error blow up, you know, rounding error blow up. So you get an answer that's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And I mean, the, what, what's for me fascinating is, is we have the mathematical tools to actually design algorithms to still deal with that problem, yeah. to sidestep the, that issue. Yes, that's quite impressive, actually, if you think about it. An algorithm that anticipates its own shortcomings. <laughs> and this is, of course, why we need humans uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, work on these problems, right? Mm. The, the computer can't do everything. Uh, we, we need to be designing things uh, in order for the computer to work reliably well. Now, on that uh, topic, vaguely related to it, there was also a NASA uh, space probe that was supposed to go to Mars. I think this oh, was in the wow. late 90s. And it crashed because um, some of the people involved in the mission were using metric units and others were using imperial units and the calculations were wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so this is a kind of nonsense that can happen when our students use degrees instead of radians, yeah. right? A change of units can have catastrophic uh, consequences. Yeah, but uh, speaking, of, uh, speaking of rounding and such, there was a really interesting discussion on, on the Discord server about 0 0.9 repeating and 1. Oh, yes! <laughs> I, I love that example because I, I think it... It, it challenges our students about, well, what is a real number, yeah. right? They, 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 we grow up in schools, we're just given real numbers, like we're given zero, and it's, it's all good, and we think it's, it's all fine. Yeah. But, but there's, there's more depth to it than, than, than some of our students might realize. And this is a good example to start uh, uh, getting into that depth. Yeah. yeah, well, this is simply a matter of representation. You have different ways of representing numbers, and we are used to uh, getting... Well, I, I think one can liken this to, uh, you know, the, the representation of rational numbers as fractions. You know, 2 over 4 and 1 over 2 is the same rational number, but we have different representations. And it's exactly the same thing that's happening here. Where, you know, you have two different representations for the real number 1. You know, 1 dot 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 0 0.9999999. So it's just two different representations. And I think... If once you get your head around the fact that you can represent a mathematical object in more than one way, uh, then it becomes slightly less disturbing to deal with things like this. Yeah, but I, I think that is a, a tricky concept to wrap your head around the first time you encounter it, that the same thing can be represented in different ways. And um, it's essential. It happens everywhere in maths. Yes, it's very interesting. I mean, I think most students would be, you know, most students would be fine with, the idea that 0 0.3 repeating equals a third, but when it gets to 0 0.9 repeating being equal to 1, uh, somehow there's a bit of hesitation that... Well, I, I think the, the thing is, um, I think our students have accepted the fact that you can represent a number with a decimal expansion and as a fraction. The difference with 0 0.9 repeating and 1 is they are both decimal representations. Yes. And, and the, the sort of the conception our students might have is that a decimal representation is unique. There's only one decimal representation for a given number. Mm. No, that's, that's the fallacy. That's, what, what they, that's what, what's difficult to get your head around. That just, well, actually, just like when you write fractions, you have different representations. Also, in decimal representation, you have different representations for the same number. Yeah, no, uh, talking about things that uh, are difficult to wrap your head around, I think the, the other thing that uh, really boggled some students' minds this week, and I told some of them you need to uh, put it on your pillow and sleep on it, is the empty set. Oh, yes. That's, uh, that, 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 uh, that one boggles the mind even of, of third-year students in real analysis. It's, it's basically like an empty box. If you think of a set as a mathematical container or a mathematical box and an empty set is simply an empty box, then it's um, not that strange. Yeah, and I, that is a very useful analogy. Uh, I also, after I saw you using it on Discord, I was starting to use it everywhere. <laughs> but I, I mean, for me, this is a good example. Also, it's, it's sometimes difficult to be told uh, by historians that zero was a big deal mm. in the history of mathematics. And it seems like, but, but how? I mean, we're so comfortable with zero. And I think this is a, a good example. Is I mean, this is another form of zero. It's a nothingness that you deal with. 
And just like people were having trouble in ancient times, like how do you add nothing to three? Or how, how, how do you write down nothing? Why, why do you have a symbol for nothing? It's, it's that same fundamental mm. difficulty we have with dealing with the empty set. I think there's another issue in that often when you want to deal with the empty set, it involves a non-trivial logic, logical concept. So when you want to say, well, the empty set is a subset of every set, or the empty set is a subset of itself, then how you understand this is by the contrapositive. Yeah. And the contrapositive is a very tricky math, uh, uh, mathematical concept or logical concept. I mean, this is the, the bane of, of math students the world over. I think if students want to see another example of something that's a bit mind-blowing, they should go on, the ones who are interested should go and read about Russell's paradox, named after the British mathematician and philosopher Bertrand Russell. So it's R-U-S-S-E-L-L. -L. If they want to go and read on Wikipedia about Russell's paradox, where you basically, it's an instance of the liar paradox, where you end up with something that looks like a set, and it has the property that it both is and is not an element of itself. And how does one resolve this paradox? So those who are interested should go and read about Russell's paradox. Yeah, no, even set theory has some some limitations in the way we define it, and you you need some uh, more serious mathematics to resolve some of those issues. Yeah, there's a lot more lurking under the surface than one realizes. Set theory is not as innocent looking as you may think. Indeed, yes. And it is shocking, actually, how close to the surface those things look. Just really from the basic questions, like if you ask the question, is there a set that is strictly bigger than the natural numbers and strictly smaller than the real numbers? Turns out this is an undecidable problem. You cannot, within the <laughs> to use for mathematics, give an answer either way for this question. It is provably impossible to answer this question. <laughs> And it is such a question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, some of these deceptively simple questions can uh, involve something, yeah, quite extreme. Mm. I mean, the, the other example that comes to mind is, of course, Fermat's the last theorem. Oh. Uh, that is, I mean, you could explain that to a, a high school or a primary school student, right? It's easy to understand the problem, but the answer, oh my word. Well, the funny thing about Fermat's last theorem is that the proof is actually there, not a proof in ZFC. It's not a proof in standard set theory, in standard mathematics, because it uses some topos theory, which goes outside of this. So technically, if you want to say a proof for a mathematical statement must be a proof in ZFC, then the problem is still open. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of Fermat's last theorem, which is so easy to formulate but so difficult to prove, and earlier I mentioned Russell's paradox, uh, Bertrand Russell used the analogy of telescopes and microscopes. And things that are very large or difficult to see, you need a telescope. Things that are very small or difficult to see, you need a microscope. Things at the human scale are easy to see, and it's the same with maths. Oftentimes, it's the very technical problems that are difficult and the very deceptively simple problems that are also very difficult, and the relatively mm. easy problems are the ones that lie in between. If you think of the Goldbach conjecture, mm. that's another problem that you can even explain to a primary school child, but uh, you know, it's try and prove it, and that's a different story. Wow, so many uh, beautiful things coming up just from a, a discussion of a first week in calculus. <laughs> yeah, well, Rory, what's coming up next week? Well, next week we, we, we finally get to functions, right? And this is going to be the, the central object, I say, that we study in this course. Mm -hmm. Everything is going to be about functions, right? And their properties and, and things we can do with functions. So that, that's what we're covering next week, right? We'll quickly define, well, what does it mean? Uh, what is this object function? Uh, we'll expand our vocabulary a little bit, uh, introduce all kinds of types of functions, injective, um, decreasing, even, oddness, and we'll look at those. And then we'll, uh, of course, uh, go through what is the graph of a function, a few ways of manipulating them through translations, reflection, scaling. 
And then very importantly, of course, combining functions, right? Taking arithmetic combinations. Can we add two functions together to give us a new functions? And uh, the, the most interesting way of combining them, composition, mm -hmm. right? Applying one function after the other to form a new function. And, and that will uh, finish out our, our, our first theme uh, with functions, right? And this will be our, our basic language that we need to agree on in terms to start developing our theory for functions. Yes, and then we start getting to calculus, uh, calculus proper, limits, uh, derivatives, integrals. Indeed, after that, uh, we'll all be based on, on, on functions following that. So, yeah, uh, that's the plan for next week. And also next week happening is the, the first tutorial test on Friday, which will be based on the first week of uh, lectures. So uh, I think it's fair. We've seen the test. Yeah, we thought it was nice. Let's hope the students agree. <laughs> I think we, we may have different uh, aesthetics. <laughs> Indeed. On the other hand, looking at some of the stuff going on on Discord, I'm not so sure. Yeah. So I, I think this, this first week might have been a, a little crazy for students with so much happening and they have to learn all these new systems and how things work at the University of Pretoria. But hopefully they'll, they'll start uh, slowly getting into the rhythm of things and, and things will stabilize a little bit and they'll find out, well, how to, to deal with uh, some of the issues uh, going forward. This is not meant to be easy. If you wanted to do something easy, you wouldn't have come to the University of Pretoria to do BSc. So if, you, if you're finding it difficult, that's understandable, but do not give up. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a, a beautiful, good challenge and, and you can rise to it. There's a saying in, uh, I think it's Japanese, the boat rises with the tide. Students rise to the occasion. Yeah, I agree. And I just, I, I feel, you know, you may be feeling a little overwhelmed and confused and, you know, don't know, don't know where you're, whether you're coming or going. That's normal. I remember my first year for about a month, I, I turned the wrong way every, every morning I left my, 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 my res room. <laughs> you know, so but eventually, you know, you settle into a pattern, you know, start, things start uh, sort of coming together. So just stick with it. Okay. Well, I, I think that's uh, about it. I want to uh, thank our students for bringing so much enthusiasm and energy into the course. Right. Uh, together, I think we can have a, a, a lot of fun in this course. And I'd like to say to keep up the good work. Okay. So we'll be uh, seeing you in tutorials and online. Uh, cheers. Bye. Goodbye. Okay,